Hi everyone, I'm Eric from the book blog LonesomeReader.com and it is a searing hot day in London today. I think there's supposed to be a high of 32 degrees. I just don't do well in the heat. I don't know about you, but uh, I just melt. I was born and raised in the chilly woods of Maine in New England, so I, I was not born to deal with this kind of heat. Uh, what I like to do on days like this is just get a pile of books and come into my book cave here and read all day in the dark, in the cool dark, <laughs> um, and stay away from the heat. Because I, I know some people like to go out in parks and, uh, you know, lounge on the grass and, and read in the sunshine while working on their tan, but I just find it really uncomfortable, like that you get sweaty and hot and, and there's bugs and it's dirty and there's people around playing loud music and there's dogs running around and like and and it's all like lovely like I'll, I'll sit for a while in the park but um but I don't want to I, I can't it's not a good reading experience I get like too distracted I just like end up looking around you know at everything and um so I much prefer just staying in the cool darkness um unfortunately I won't be able to stay in here all day because I have to go to work in a short while but I'm gonna do a bit of reading in here first because the fabulous Jen Campbell tagged me in her try a story book tag, um, which is a, a, um, a tag which uh, actually she didn't come up with. She adapted it from the try a chapter tag to get people to read new novels. But she's adapted it, so you pick five short story collections and read the first short story in each of those collections and then see if you want to carry on with those collections or set them aside. So this is a challenge that I'm really excited about because I love short stories. I, I usually have a short story collection on the go where I'll just like read one now and then and in the mornings I find it quite a nice experience to just uh, read a short story right when I wake up and get out of bed. So the five books that I chose, um, the first is uh, The Kiss and Other Stories by Anton Chekhov, um, which is obviously a very old book, but actually this is a new translation uh, by Hugh Alpin, and it's published by Alma Books. And uh, I've, I've read some of Chekhov's stories before um, and liked them a lot, and, um, and his plays also, and actually I've acted in some of his plays. Uh, and he's a fantastic writer, but I've always thought of him as just sort of a stuffy old writer. And I, so I was sort of delighted when um, I opened this book and discovered this portrait, which I'll show you. Hmm. He's actually a fairly, like, handsome man, isn't he? Hmm. So, uh, so that perked my interest and made me want to try to read um, these a bit more. So... Um, I'm going to read the first story from that. And then the next book I picked is called The Springs of Affection by Maeve Brennan. She's uh, an Irish writer. Um, this is a reprint by the Stinging Fly Press. Um, this book of short stories has been out of print for quite a long time. They've just reprinted it recently. The Stinging Fly is a fantastic um, Irish press. They, um, they mainly publish a journal um, with new work by writers. Uh, regularly, but they do publish some books too, um, and really fantastic high quality books. Uh, I first read Maeve Brennan in this other um, anthology of short stories, which I'll just pull down from my shelves and show you, called The Long Gaze Back, um, which was published last year, and I read it at the very end of last year and chose it as one of my favorite books of the year because it's fantastic. There's such a huge diversity of really fascinating uh, Irish authors, female Irish authors in here, and uh, this is really worth reading. I've discovered so many great writers through this, um, like uh, Lisa McNerney, um, whose novel The Glorious Heresies um, has gone on to win a number of awards this year and is fantastic. So I'm going to read um, the first story in The Springs of Affection, and, uh, and this also includes an introduction by the fantastic Anne Enright, whose writing I absolutely love. The next book is uh, this book called Prodigals by Greg Jackson. And uh, this was published by Granta Books um, a few months ago. And I, I've been wanting to get to it for a while. It's a really like trippy cover, isn't it? Mm. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I got really interested in reading this after I listened to a podcast with Greg Jackson uh, on 
KCRW's Bookworm, which is a fantastic podcast. Um, if uh, any of you haven't listened to it, you should really listen to it. It's hosted by Michael Silverblatt, who is just the most em empathic, uh, sensitive reader. And he, he's really sensitive. He gets so emotional. He always sounds like he's on the brink of crying. And, <laughs> and uh, Greg Jackson um, had a fantastic interview with him. So um, I'm really interested in reading these stories. The next book I picked is another book I've been meaning to get to for a while. It was published a few months ago called Vertigo uh, by Joanna Walsh. This was published by And Other Stories. And I think in Ireland it was published by Tramp Press, which is a really fantastic small press. Um, but this is um, the edition by And Other Stories, which is also a fantastic press. They publish really diverse and interesting books. And uh, so I've been hearing a lot about this and mean, been meaning to get to it for a long time. Um, and it's a very short book, short collection. But uh, So I'm going to read the first story in this. And the last book I picked to try out um, was this book, Fen, by Daisy Johnson. It was uh, just published recently by Jonathan Cape. And it's been getting a lot of praise. Um, Jen Campbell's praised it, and uh, Sa Simon from Savage Reads has been praising it. So, um, so I'm really intrigued. Uh, to try it out. It has great inside covers and if I'll just read the blurb because it makes it sound really intriguing and fantastical. The Fen is a liminal land. Real people live their lives here. They wrestle with familiar instincts, with sex and desire, with everyday routine. But the wild is always close at hand, ready to erupt. This is a place where animals and people commingle and fuse where curious metamorphoses take place, where myth and dark magic still linger. So here, a teenager may starve herself into the shape of an eel. A house might fall in love with a girl. A woman might give birth to a... Well, what? So, I'm going to find out and read the first story of this collection. So, I'm going to go away now and read the first short stories in all these collections, and then I'll come back and let you know briefly what I thought. Hi again, it is the next day uh, because I didn't manage to finish reading all the stories before I had to go to work. A couple of them are quite long, so, um, so I read them uh, last evening and then this morning. And uh, wow, what a really varied, interesting bunch. So I'm going to go right into talking about them. The first, again, is uh, The Kiss and Other Stories. The, the first story in this is actually the title story called The Kiss. And it's about a Russian group of uh, army officers who are camped. And uh, the local landowner invites them all to um, come have tea. So they go along, and there's dinner, and then there's games, and dancing, and, uh, and it's uh, all a bit stuffy and formal. And there's this one officer named um, Captain Ryabovich, who, uh, who is the most sort of nervous and reserved of the bunch, and he, he just sort of sits at the back and is just watching everything happen around him. Um, he, he seems to lack a lot of self-confidence. And uh, at one point he goes to play billiards with some of the other men and then gets bored with that and so goes back to um, the, the main room. But along the way he gets a bit lost and he sees this um, darkened room and a door is slightly open. And in the darkness a woman grabs him, uh, says, oh, you finally came, um, gives him a kiss on the neck. And then she realizes that this isn't the man that she was waiting for, um, for her rendezvous. So he, he quickly walks away embarrassed, but he doesn't see who the woman is. And uh, so for the rest of the evening, he's consumed with wondering who this woman was. And the that act of the kiss seems to spark something in him. It inspires some uh, engagement with life that he, he hadn't felt before. And there's this um, beautiful way that he describes um, the, the sensation he can still feel on his neck from the kiss, um, which he describes as um, mint drops. So he becomes sort of obsessed with this experience and, and continues to think about it. And um, there's, it's sort of funny how it describes how he looks at all the different women in the room, wondering who the mystery woman might be. And he, he, he in a strange way, he sort of pieces his 
what his ideal woman would be out of all of these different parts of the woman. Like he likes the, the shoulders of one woman and then the scent and dress of another woman. And, and, uh, and so he, he pieces them all together in his mind and it becomes this really intense image in his imagination, which he becomes obsessed with. And um, after they leave and in the weeks following as the, the army moves on, um, he's still thinking about it. And then sometime later, he returns back to the same place where they went to this um, household for the party. And he uh, looks at it with sort of longing and has these conflicted feelings about uh, his imagined future and the possibilities that he might have missed. And, uh, and it, it comes across in this really touching way. And there's this very, I thought, moving passage when he's near the house and he's by some water, he, he says, the, the water was fast running and was gurgling barely audibly around the piles of the bathing hut. The red moon was reflected beside the left-hand bank. Little waves ran across its reflection, stretching it out, tearing it to pieces, and seemingly wanting to carry it away. And I thought that so beautifully captured his emotional mood um, through these this physical image of the the moon reflected in the water and being sort of torn apart and it's all contains all of his his constrained passion that he's not able to express in his life and uh, so i I thought this was an absolutely beautiful really poignant story and uh, it's um it it made me really want to read a lot more Chekhov so um, I'm definitely going to read more from this book. Next, I read the first story from the Maeve Brennan collection, Springs of Affection, and uh, the first story in this is called The Morning After the Big Fire. And it's a, it's a fairly short, concentrated story, very simple in some ways, about a, um, someone, the, the narrator, recalling uh, his or her childhood growing up in this house and how one night... Um, a garage nearby that they can see outside the windows of their house suddenly caught on fire and burnt to the ground along with some cars around it. And the sensation this child felt of such excitement about this big event happening in the local neighborhood. And uh, it sort of reflects this feeling of a childhood desire for for change or excitement outside of our normal experience. The narrative gets this intense sense of excitement the next morning, going around and telling all the neighbors, like, oh, did you hear that this local garage burnt to the ground? And, and, uh, and feeling this real pride and ownership of the event. And the narrator expresses this, this longing to return to this state of excitement, to, to feel this sense of possession over an event and, uh, and to be able to spread the gossip like that. And it's, um, it, it, it gets at that sort of selfish sense in our lives of, dis of disregarding the social welfare or caring about other people, um, but just longing for this uh, sense of change in our lives. And, uh, and so I thought it was a, um, a really touching sort of small, um, I hate to use the word like slice of life, but, it like a, but yeah, it really like captures just this very like small moment of experience that can bloom into to something much bigger than, than what it was and, and how a seemingly small insignificant event can really loom large in our memories and in our imaginations. Maeve Brennan is a really perceptive and um, interesting writer, so um, I, I definitely want to read more from this collection. Next, I read the first story in Prodigals by Greg Jackson, and uh, this story was called uh, Wagner in the Desert. It's narrated from the point of view of this man whose friends go out to Palm Springs because they're planning on having a baby soon, and so they have this thing called their baby bucket list of things they want to do before they have a baby, and they know they're not probably not going to be able to do them anymore. And so they just go out to have this completely debauched weekend um, where they do lots of drugs and are having sex. There's also a friend there called Lily, who the narrator is very sexually attracted to and wants to get with. And, uh, and so it describes their experience of this weekend. And also the, the, um, the man of the couple um, is a, um, makes movies and he wants to get funding for this uh, movie that he's working on and uh, he hears that there's a um, sort of 
producer in the area called Wagner, um, who he wants to meet um, and try to uh, entice to help fund this project. And so it's about their debauched weekend. Writing is really beautiful, um, but there's something about the sort of tone of the narrator, which I found really off-putting. He's very self-obsessed and he's trying to find meaning in his life, uh, but he he just feels, particularly in this milieu of people, that it's all a bit shallow and meaningless. And there's this sense of narcissism and um, defeatism and, and, uh, and uh, all he can sort of seek is um, empty pleasure. There's a passage where um, um, he, he says, I realized that there was something I wanted, although it was not exactly a group activity, which was to lie on the bathroom floor and masturbate until I died. <laughs> and it's like, where do you go from there? Um, he, he just, uh, in, he, then he describes his experience masturbating and, this, and the, the fantasies in his head, and they, they go on to have a party and do lots of drugs, and, uh, and he has these conflicted feelings about purpose in life, it's like he's having a debate over um, whether experience can only be hollow and dictated by our circumstances or if we can really find purposeful meaning in our lives. And he, he debates these things in a sort of semi-serious way. Um, they, they, um, they do come across the man named Wagner who gives um, this, this uh, speech in this sort of non-realistic way about, about, uh, about purpose in life. Um, and uh, and the conversations he has with a man named Nietzsche, uh, who um, who isn't you know the real Nietzsche, and he's not the real Wagner. They're these modern embodiments of those men and those ideas. So I think he's this is obviously very intellectual writing, and um, and uh, but I I I get I get sort of frustrated with um, with writing like this that that um that that doesn't seem to to value the the beauty of individual experience or um and and is all just a bit sort of dismissive and feels like there it's it's over everything and so it i mean i can i can see how it's it's a sort of touchstone to a modern sensibility and frustration that particularly people of a certain social class and um, who are or educated and privileged would feel, um, but I, I feel it's it's not really sympathetic to a much wider human experience. So I wasn't I wasn't totally sold by this, though I admire the writing, and um, and I'll be intrigued to read more of his stories and see if he he goes anywhere else with his writing. Um, but uh, but uh, yeah, I think I might for the time being just set this aside. <laughs> So next is a very different kind of story. It's uh, Joanna Walsh's story in Vertigo, um, and it's called Fin de Collection. It's a very short story. It's only four pages long, but it's incredibly intriguing. Um, sort of like Greg Jackson, it's, um, it's, it's also very intelligent and cerebral, but in a very concentrated way. It, it, it opens with a, this very intriguing uh, paragraph which is, a friend told me to buy a dress in Paris because I am leaving my husband. The right teller can make any tale. The right dresser can make any dress. Listen to me carefully. I am not the right teller. And so then immediately you're mistrustful of her or wondering what she's holding back or why she can't go into why she's leaving her husband. And uh, so the, the story goes on then to recount her time in Paris looking at clothes going into these very upscale shops and reflecting on the women who shop in them and what these women's histories are and how she wants to absorb these women's history and experience into her own, into the way she presents herself in, um, in how people perceive her. It's very much about how we appear to the world and how others see us. This meditation about identity, and there's this, this wonderful passage about the changing fashion in these shops. And she writes, Come December, the first wisps of lace and chiffon will appear, and with them bottomless skies reflected blue in mere swimming pools. And I love that image of how the 
bottomless sky reflected in this pool. And so it's these, these two empty spaces sort of reflecting themselves, or these spaces which have greater depth, which uh, people can't see because all they see are the reflection, the surface. And it, 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 um, it speaks about how we see each other and how we judge each other on appearances and how obviously there's a lot of depth there that we don't see. But these first impressions that we make um, are what are really lasting in a lot of our imaginations and understanding of other people. Um, so even though this is a very short, elusive story, um, you don't really know much about this woman's character other than what she thinks about all these other people and of um, the, the fashion and her, her thoughts on being an identity. Um, it, it, uh, it's, a, it's a really intriguing story. And uh, so I'm very interested to read the other stories and what else Joanna Walsh does in this collection. Next, I read the first story in Daisy Johnson's collection, Fen, um, called Starver. This story, wow, is really imaginative and creepy and odd, and um, it's, it's unsettling um, in this very uh, quiet way. It, um, it begins with a, a account of the land being drained of water and the eels which lived in that water sort of scrambling to these puddles and how people gathered them up and tried to keep these eels alive but um, but the the eels refused to eat and so gradually just starved themselves then it changes to a story about the um, the the narrator's friend Katie and how her friend Katie suddenly stops eating and gradually she loses herself, she diminishes and just um, sort of wastes away. And this friend covers up for her that she's not eating with her friends and family. And But you don't understand completely why she's starving herself in this way. Um, it, um, it reminded me a bit about um, Han Kane's novel, The Vegetarian, of a woman who just suddenly stops eating meat and um, gradually starts... Um, wasting away and and the the reactions of people around her um from this refusal to stop eating meat um but of course this girl has refused to eat altogether and so is really wasting away to nothing how she is teased by um, other girls at school and the way boys perceive her at school and um and so it it seems like if you wanted to do a very like surface interpretation about it, it i guess you could say it's about sort of anorexia and teenage anorexia and um but but that seems too simplistic for me i don't um for a story like this which is so imaginatively put i'm afraid to give that straightforward an interpretation of it i think it's much more elusive than that how she gradually wastes away and then burrows away and hides she she becomes like this creature like a eel like creature and uh, so it, it's it's sort of fantastical, but it feels like in a symbolic way it gets at real world feelings in a way much stronger than a straightforward realistic narrative could, you know. Um, so it, it has that that really intense quality, you know, like Angela Carter. So yeah, I'm really intrigued and driven on to want to read more of these stories. I hadn't heard of Daisy Johnson before, and I think this is her first book. So, um, so yeah, I think this is a really interesting, intriguing new writer. So those are my short story um, challenges of the tag. Um, really five interesting, diverse collections, um, and all of which um, I really want to carry on with, with the possible excep exception of Greg Jackson, which I, I'm I do want to read, I, but uh, I think I might, yeah, just put it aside for a while. I think it's one of those books that's just, like, not right for me now. I think it's really interesting, too, the challenge of reading different authors um, up against each other because you see how ideas resonate throughout these different stories, um, similar ideas about identity and gender, how the different authors give different interpretations of them. I think, like, gender in particular is quite interesting in this group of books because um, you you have two stories that are from a very strong 
female point of view by female writers, and then two stories from a very strong male point of view by male writers. And uh, the only exception, I guess, is Maeve Brennan, who um, whose story, the uh, the narrator in it, um, who's reflecting back on his or her childhood, their gender isn't actually, unless I missed it, I don't think it's actually specified. So I think it's really interesting seeing all these different uh, variations on similar themes and uh, and the s- different styles that the writers use to go about um, exploring them. So those are my five short stories for the Try a Story tag. But now I'd really like to hear from you. Uh, what are some of your favorite books of short stories? Um, or what are some really good books of short stories that you've read recently? Uh, let me know in the comments below. Um, but also, since this is a tag video, I'd like to tag some other booktubers um, that I really like. Um, though I'd really like to see everybody try out this tag if you have your own channel. Make your own video about five or less, if you want, um, books of short stories to read the first short story out of and then see which books you'd like to continue on with. Uh, but I'd like to highlight five booktubers in particular that I really like. Um, I'll tag Helen, the bookish owl, uh, Amy at Shout at Me, uh, Max at Well Done Books, Will at My Bookish Empire, and Vivian at Lamp Sunnies. Um, they're five really great booktubers, and I'd really like to know from all of them what um, five books of short stories they're interested in reading and have been wanting to pick up. I think picking out the first story and trying it out like this is a really good taster to show you whether you'll get on with the book or not, whether it's right for you now or not. So um, thank you very much for watching. If you want to see more of my thoughts about books, please subscribe. And let's all hope for slightly more mild weather uh, that makes for more conducive reading conditions, because trying to read and concentrate when it's really, really hot, particularly if you read on a commute like I do on a busy tube train, which is stuffed and really hot, it makes it really difficult to read. And also just to say, let's get reading more short stories because short stories are fantastic. Okay? Thanks for watching. Bye.